<coughs> Here we have uh, Perry and uh, the prosecuting attorney, Hamilton Berger, which I always wondered if they called him Hamburger. <laughs> Friends. Uh, <coughs> uh, that ran for 271 episodes. That, that's a pretty long run. Uh, in the more modern era, um, in the more modern era, uh, Law and Order has run for 479 episodes and counting. Uh, that began running in 1990 and it's running today. Uh, and I just point those two things out uh, to basically uh, say or to, to kind of get an agreement that as a people, we enjoy courtroom drama. Uh, the, the Americans seem to, to love that. Uh, we get a lot of entertainment out of it. Uh, and, uh, and there's a, a wide variety of shows besides those two that are based on courtroom drama. And it's just something that, uh, that we eat up. Um, I think that the prophet Micah must have loved it too. Uh, and if he were alive today, he would probably be a fan of Perry Mason um, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and I say that because the passage we're going to look at today that he wrote, uh, he did some creative writing. Uh, it, it is a combination of poetry, uh, but as an outline setting theme, he uses uh, the courtroom language. He makes it seem like it's a, a trial of some sort. Uh, and it's not exactly perfect, but it follows that general idea. And so that's what we're going to look at today. And, and we're going to begin by looking at Micah chapter 6, uh, verses 1 and 2. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. If you're using our worship Bible, page 759. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear you mountains the Lord's accusation. Listen you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. So what we have here, uh, loosely, uh, is the summons. Uh, he begins by uh, kind of calling forth for, to stand up uh, and plead his case before the mountains. And so that is the, uh, the summons to the trial. And we also have here uh, the jury selection. Uh, instead of the ordinary kinds of juries that we're familiar with, he calls upon nature itself to be the, the, the jury. This is going to be tried in front of the mountains, and in fact, the everlasting foundations of the earth. Um, pretty stable jury uh, around for a while. And so uh, that poetic uh, thing begins to go on. Uh, the next verse, verse 3, Hear my people, or <clears throat> my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. And so here we have the charge. Uh, his people are being charged basically with the idea of treating God like he's just a burden. They have been uh, slighting him, ignoring him, apparently complaining about him. Oh, God's just such a burden. We have to do this and that, and we, you know, we have to get up and go to church in a snowstorm. <laughs> well, maybe they didn't say that. But, <laughs> but you know, they, they're, they're treating God apparently like he was just a problem. Like, you know, he was a nuisance or a burden to them, uh, which in reality is kind of the opposite of the truth. Uh, but that's the charge. The people are treating God like a burden. And so he lays it out there in verse 3. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
I hate it when the pages stick together. So we're going to look at verses 4 and 5 next. Uh, God speaking here. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak king of Moab uh, plotted and what Balaam son of Beor answered? Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. And so here we basically have God's defense. Uh, he's been accused of being a burden and a problem and kind of a nuisance and, and that. Uh, and instead, he mounts this defense showing what he has done. And he uh, does that through several stages. Uh, he tells them to remember. And so he's calling upon their own past, not some other stories that they've never heard before. Uh, but he's calling them to remember their own past and highlights uh, several things. He talks about their exodus from Egypt and slavery. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, most of us are very familiar with those stories of, uh, of Moses being called to lead them out of Egypt uh, and, you know, the ten plagues to convince the Pharaoh and then uh, getting out and then having the barrier of the Red Sea and the, the parting of the Red Sea just so they could walk through and all of those things. And so God's telling them to remember those things. Uh, and, you know, and if you go back to that story, it talks about how, uh, how terrible it was for them in Egypt and how they were just groaning under their burden and all of that and they, they pleaded with God to do something. And then he did. And so uh, if they would remember these things, they would begin to think, oh, maybe God's not such a burden after all. Uh, and then he moves on from there and reminds them that he raised up uh, leaders from, for them. Uh, he, he specifically cites Moses and Aaron and Miriam and talks about how he called them up and they led them and, and, uh, and all of those things. And it's important uh, a lot of times for us to have good leaders. And so God is uh, reminding them that he provided that for them when they needed it. Uh, he reminds them of the Balak and Balaam story. How many of you remember that story? It's less common than some of the other stories. So they're uh, in this land around Moab. Um, and the, the leader there is Balak. And uh, he doesn't like the Israelites. He doesn't want them around. He's afraid of them. And so there's a guy in the area named Balaam who is known to be kind of a, 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 a diviner, a supernatural kind of guy, uh, kind of a pagan prophet and those kinds of things. And so Balaam gets the idea. He's going to call Balaam to put a curse on Israel. That's, that's, his, that's his strategy. Hire Balaam to put a curse on Israel. So he hires Balaam. And uh, Balaam comes out and, you know, overlooks Israel. And, uh, but then uh, he gets a warning from God. Uh, if you want to go back and read the story, it's a good story. Uh, uh, there's, there's a talking donkey involved uh, and those kinds of things. So, so Balaam is warned not to put a curse on Israel. Instead, he blesses them. And Balak complained, no, I hired you to curse these guys, and you blessed them. And Balaam's like, look, what, what can I do? You know, the, if, if God has blessed them, how can I curse them? You know, and, and so he ends up doing it more than once. Uh, and he ends up uh, cursing some of the other surrounding areas. And, uh, and, and so God flip-flopped that strategy. Put a curse on Israel, Balaam puts the blessings on him instead. So, so that didn't pan out, but that's God reminding them of what he did. And then he tells them to remember their journey from Shittim to Gilgal. And, uh, and they, uh, they think about that. Now, from our perspective, um, this is the area uh, from one side of the Jordan to the other. When they finally, after they had wandered in the desert for all those 40 years and stuff, Joshua takes over after Moses passes. Uh, this is that part of the journey. Uh, and when they travel to Gilgal, it's at Gilgal that, uh, that they're now ready to invade and conquer the promised land. 
when they made that crossing go across the Jordan River. And by the way, that crossing included uh, a secondary story not too unlike the Red Sea. Uh, when they needed to cross the Jordan River uh, to get from Shittim to Gilgal, uh, God performed another miracle. And he had a representative from each tribe. Uh, they, they, they had to go, they, and he held the staff. And the Jordan River dammed itself up. And, and the water held back. And they were able to walk across the Jordan River with a wall of water on one side of them. Uh, and, and a representative from each tribe was told to take a stone from the, from the riverbed and carry it out. And they made a monument when they got to the other side in Gilgal and set up that monument there to remind them that God had brought them across the Jordan River and so on and so forth. And so God was reminding them of that part of the story. And it was from Gilgal that God sent uh, the two spies uh, to go and check out Jericho one last time. And, uh, and they're the ones that got hidden and rescued by um, uh, one of the uh, uh, Jericho. Uh, and then they went to Jericho and marched around it and the walls fell down all that. So that's this part that God's reminding them of, that part of their journey. Uh, and so uh, they have some good memories. Uh, they, they, you know, here they are moaning and groaning about God being a burden. And God says, this is, what I, this is the burden I've been. I did this, 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 and this for you. Remember those things, people. So that's what he's telling them. Um, not bad uh, suggestion for ourselves. Uh, when we start to feel uh, sometimes a little weary of God, Remember what he's done for us. Remember what he's done for you. Um, and think back biblically to all of those things that he's done for us as a people. Uh, Christianity uh, and humanity. Uh, let's move on to uh, Micah 6 and 7. Uh, with what shall I come before the Lord? And bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Uh, and so here we have... Um, kind of the, the cross-examine. Uh, God has accused them. God has given his defense. And so they want to come back to God and ask questions of their own. And the truth is, um, they are both sarcastic and arrogant uh, in their questioning. Uh, and so they begin with something. What, what, what should we do to make up for it? Should we give uh, a, a year-old calf a burnt offering? Which is a small thing. And then they say, uh, they, they move to absurd. Uh, would you be pleased if we brought you a thousand rams and you know, a, a thousand rivers of olive oil? Think about that. Could you give a thousand rivers of olive oil? Uh, that's just absurd. You know, now they're getting ridiculous. Like, what do you want, God? Come on. Uh, and then they go from being absurd basically to being obscene. What, 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 should, we, don't, should we sacrifice our firstborn? The fruit of our own body. And, uh, and we know God has very specifically made it clear that human sacrifice is not something that's ever acceptable. And uh, he's against that and has taught them that. Uh, and so they're just being, you know, acting as if they think that God might want that from them. Uh, that God's putting upon them these impossible things from the small sacrifice to the absurd idea of, you know, rivers of olive oil uh, to the obscene suggestion that God wants them to sacrifice their firstborn. Uh, <clears throat> none of that was good. The first part of verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? Uh, so here we kind of have... <laughs> The summation preference, preface. I mean, uh, he's about to give his final answer, sum up the, his argument before the jury, uh, but he does that with the preface by asking the question. Uh, and there's two important things that I think we ought to notice here 
Uh, what is that reference to, uh, to, to we mortals? Uh, what does the Lord require to be, oh, mortal? And, and I think that, that that terminology is interesting, and some of the scholars point out that what he's really trying to remind them of is their place in all of this. He's drawing that contrast between um, creator and created. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, here's God the creator. Compared to him, who are we? We're the mortals. We're the created beings that uh, don't have infinity uh, in our beings. Um, God ends up granting that everlasting life to, to his people. Um, but that's a miracle of resurrection. Uh, it's not one of our characteristics. Uh, and so he reminds them of who they are. Remember your place. Uh, and then he also says, you know, he has shown you. And here again he's pointing out that this is not something new. Uh, this is things that they've been taught previously. They can go back in their history and, and remember what the other prophets have said and remember you know, what, what they've been taught by God and all of those things, all of those lessons. Uh, and you get the idea that uh, you already know that he's not demanding of you rivers and rivers of olive oil and he's certainly not demanding of you the firstborn. You know what he really wants. And that brings us to uh, the second part of verse 8, the summation. This is where he really gets into uh, the, the final part of this answer. To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So it's a kind of a three-part summation. What he really wants of you are those three things. To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. And I want to look just briefly at each of those. Uh, first is the idea of to act justly. Uh, <clears throat> the idea of being fair and honest, um, those kinds of things, to both yourself, to God, and to others. That's what it means to act justly. Uh, things like prejudice and bias and bribery and all of those things are out the window. Uh, we are to act justly. We are to treat people um, the way they deserve to be treated uh, and give them their due. That is to act justly. Uh, and we are also to love mercy. Uh, there are those who say that, uh, that in our era that justice must be tempered with mercy. And Jesus gave multiple parables about the parables uh, about forgiving people, uh, including uh, you know the, the 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 debt parables, where the guy owes a little bit of money uh, to the big guy and uh, uh, he forgives it, and then uh, he's owed a little debt and doesn't want to forgive the little debt because he has no mercy. Uh, he wants to exact justice on the person. Um, <clears throat> And so that idea of, of uh, loving mercy, and not just to those who deserve it. Um, have you ever, uh, uh, well, I know you have, but the need to forgive someone who didn't ask for forgiveness, didn't apologize, didn't claim responsibility, didn't admit guilt, but you still need to forgive them. That's hard to do. A lot harder to forgive someone who comes to you begging and pleading for forgiveness. Uh, but part of loving mercy uh, is, is having mercy to the extent that you're giving mercy to those who don't even deserve mercy in your own eyes. Um, <clears throat> how much mercy did we deserve uh, when Jesus went to a cross for us? So there's that. And then the, the last part uh, is to walk humbly with your God. Um, the idea of walking humbly, humbly uh, means to, uh, to recognize your place. Remember that you're the mortal. You're the creator. He's the creator. Remember that part. Uh, remember that you don't deserve the mercy and grace that he's bestowed upon you. You didn't earn it. Um, <clears throat> um, and so you, you live in your place uh, as God's uh, servant, as God's subjects, and all of that. 
And so that is the, uh, the third thing that God wants us to do. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but then, uh, one more thing I want to mention, uh, and that is that if we, that, that summary, to act justly, to love mercy, to walk holy with God, we need to make sure that we integrate the three. The temptation too often is to do one and not the other, or do two up and not the third, but they really need to come hand in hand. Uh, for example, uh, the idea of uh, acting justly, um, <clears throat> that idea of justice being tempered by mercy, uh, so this is what they deserve, but I'm only going to do this. Um, <clears throat> and to love mercy. Uh, there are those who love mercy but don't want to act justly. One of the examples I read about this is the person who <clears throat> makes a big donation uh, to, a, to a charity to help poor people. But the donation comes from money that he cheated out of a bunch of other people and clients. So he wasn't acting justly when he cheated all these people to get the big bucks. And he got the big bucks and made a generous donation with it. So he was showing mercy, but not acting justly. Uh, and then of course, um, the idea of, of God being in there. Uh, if you're doing those things for some motive other than um, being like God and letting God help you, uh, some people like to be merciful because of the reputation it earns them. Uh, but we need to make sure that we're walking humbly with God or the other things that we do won't amount to much. Um, we can't think in terms of uh, our rituals, the, you know, those sacrifices that they talked about. Um, those things aren't enough. It's about uh, who we are and our character as summarized in those three particular kinds of acts. Um, <clears throat> so that's our challenge for today uh, in this uh, brief courtroom drama uh, where God was being accused of being a burden, and reminds the people that instead that uh, he's their savior, and then tells them how they ought to act in response to that being their savior. So let's pray. <clears throat>